Section 10 of Sophisms of the Protectionists. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sophisms of the Protectionists by Frederic Bastia. Translated by Horace White. Section 10. Part 2. Sophisms of Protection. Second Series. The request of industry to the government is as modest as that of Diogenes to Alexander. Stand out of my sunshine. Bentham. 1. Natural History of Spoilation. Why do I give myself up to that dry science, political economy? The question is a proper one. All labor is so repugnant in its nature that one has the right to ask of what use it is. Let us examine and see. I do not address myself to those philosophers who, if not in their own names, at least in the name of humanity, profess to adore poverty. I speak to those who hold wealth in esteem, and understand by this word not the opulence of the few, but the comfort, the well-being, the security, the independence, the instruction, the dignity, of all. There are only two ways by which the means essential to the preservation, the adornment, and the perfection of life may be obtained, production and spoliation. Some persons may say, spoliation is an accident, a local and transient abuse, denounced by morality, punished by the law, and unworthy the attention of political economy. Still, however, benevolent or optimistic one may be, he is compelled to admit that spoliation is practiced on so vast a scale in this world, and is so generally connected with all great human events, that no social science, and least of all political economy, can refuse to consider it. I go farther. That which prevents the perfection of the social system, at least in so far as it is capable of perfection, is the constant effort of its members to live and prosper at the expense of each other, so that if spoliation did not exist, society being perfect, the social sciences would be without an object. I go still farther. When spoliation becomes a means of subsistence for a body of men united by social ties, in course of time they make a law which sanctions it, a morality which glorifies it. It is enough to name some of the best-defined forms of spoliation to indicate the position it occupies in human affairs. First comes war. Among savages, the conqueror kills the conquered, to obtain an uncontested, if not incontestable, right to game. Next, slavery. When man learns that he can make the earth fruitful by labor, he makes this division with his brother. You work, and I eat. Then comes superstition. According as you give or refuse me that which is yours, I will open to you the gates of heaven or of hell. Finally, monopoly appears. Its distinguishing characteristic is to allow the existence of the grand social law, service for service, while it brings the element of force into the discussion, and thus alters the just proportion between service received and service rendered. Spoilation always bears within itself the germ of its own destruction. Very rarely the many despoil the few. In such a case, the latter soon become so reduced that they can no longer satisfy the cupidity of the former, and spoilation ceases for want of sustenance. Almost always the few oppress the many, and in that case spoilation is none the less undermined, for if it has force as an agent, as in war and slavery, it is natural that force in the end should be on the side of the greater number. And if deception is the agent, as with superstition and monopoly, it is natural that the many should ultimately become enlightened. Another law of providence wars against spoliation. It is this. Spoliation not only displaces wealth, but also destroys a portion. War annihilates values. 
slavery paralyzes the faculties. Monopoly transfers wealth from one pocket to another, but it always occasions the loss of a portion in the transfer. This is an admirable law. Without it, provided the strength of oppressors and oppressed were equal, spoliation would have no end. A moment comes when the destruction of wealth is such that the despoiler is poorer than he would have been if he had remained honest. So it is with a people when a war costs more than the booty is worth, with a master who pays more for slave labor than for free labor, with a priesthood which has so stupefied the people and destroyed its energy that nothing more can be gotten out of it, with a monopoly which increases its attempts at absorption as there is less to absorb, just as the difficulty of milking increases with the emptiness of the udder. Monopoly is a species of the genus spoliation. It has many varieties, among them sinecure, privilege, and restriction upon trade. Some of the forms it assumes are simple and naive, like feudal rights. Under this regime, the masses are despoiled and know it. Other forms are more complicated. Often the masses are plundered, and do not know it. It may even happen that they believe that they owe everything to spoliation, not only what is left to them, but what is taken from them, and what is lost in the operation. I also assert that, in the course of time, thanks to the ingenious machinery of habit, many people become spoilers without knowing it or wishing it. Monopolies of this kind are begotten by fraud and nurtured by error. They vanish only before the light. I have said enough to indicate that political economy has a manifest practical use. It is the torch which, unveiling deceit and dissipating error, destroys that social disorder called spoliation. Someone, a woman, I believe, has correctly defined it as the safety lock upon the property of the people. Commentary If this little book were destined to live three or four thousand years, to be read and re-read, pondered and studied, phrase by phrase, word by word, and letter by letter from generation to generation, like a new Koran, if it were to fill the libraries of the world with avalanches of annotations, explanations, and paraphrases, I might leave to their fate, in their rather obscure consciousness, the thoughts which precede. But since they need a commentary, it seems wise to me to furnish it myself. The true and equitable law of humanity is the free exchange of service for service. Spoliation consists in destroying, by force or by trickery, the freedom of exchange, in order to receive a service without rendering one. Forcible spoliation is exercised thus. Wait till a man has produced something then take it from him by violence. It is solemnly condemned by the Decalogue. Thou shalt not steal. When practiced by one individual on another, it is called robbery, and leads to the prison. When practiced among nations, it takes the name of conquest, and leads to glory. Why this difference? It is worth while to search for the cause. It will reveal to us an irresistible power, public opinion, which, like the atmosphere, envelops us so completely that we do not notice it. Rousseau never said a truer thing than this. A great deal of philosophy is needed to understand the facts which are very near to us. The robber, for the reason that he acts alone, has public opinion against him. He terrifies all who are about him. Yet, if he has companions, he plumes himself before them on his exploits, and here we may begin to notice the power of public opinion, for the approbation of his band serves to obliterate all consciousness of his turpitude, and even to make him proud of it. The warrior lives in a different atmosphere. The public opinion which would rebuke him is among the vanquished. He does not feel its influence. But the opinion of those by whom he is surrounded approves his acts, and sustains him. He and his comrades are vividly conscious of the common interest which unites them. 
The country which has created enemies and dangers needs to stimulate the courage of its children. To the most daring, to those who have enlarged the frontiers, and gathered the spoils of war, are given honors, reputation, glory. Poets sing their exploits. Fair women weave garlands for them. And such is the power of public opinion that it separates the idea of injustice from spoilation, and even rids the despoiler of the consciousness of his wrongdoing. The public opinion which reacts against military spoilation, as it exists among the conquered, and not among the conquering people, has very little influence, but it is not entirely powerless. It gains in strength as nations come together and understand one another better. Thus it can be seen that the study of languages and the free communication of peoples tend to bring about the supremacy of an opinion opposed to this sort of spoliation. Unfortunately, it often happens that the nations adjacent to a plundering people are themselves spoilers when opportunity offers, and hence are imbued with the same prejudices. Then there is only one remedy. Time. It is necessary that nations learn by harsh experience the enormous disadvantage of despoiling each other. You say there is another restraint. Moral influences. But moral influences have for their object the increase of virtuous actions. How can they restrain these acts of spoliation, when these very acts are raised by public opinion to the level of the highest virtues? Is there a more potent moral influence than religion? Has there ever been a religion more favorable to peace, or more universally received than Christianity? And yet what has been witnessed during eighteen centuries? Men have gone out to battle, not merely in spite of religion, but in the very name of religion. A conquering nation does not always wage offensive war. Its soldiers are obliged to protect the hearthstones, the property, the families, the independence and liberty of their native land. At such a time war assumes a character of sanctity and grandeur. The flag, blessed by the ministers of the God of Peace, represents all that is sacred on earth. The people rally to it as the living image of their country and their honor. The warlike virtues are exalted above all others. When the danger is over, the opinion remains, and by a natural reaction of the spirit of vengeance, which confounds itself with patriotism, they love to bear the cherished flag from capital to capital. It seems that nature has thus prepared the punishment of the aggressor. It is the fear of this punishment, and not the progress of philosophy, which keeps arms in the arsenal, for it cannot be denied that those people who are most advanced in civilization make war, and bother themselves very little with justice, when they have no reprisals to fear. Witness the Himalayas, the Atlas, and the Caucasus. If religion had been impotent, if philosophy is powerless, how is war to cease? Political economy demonstrates that even if the victors alone are considered, war is always begun in the interest of the few, and at the expense of the many. All that is needed, then, is that the masses should clearly perceive this truth. The weight of public opinion, which is yet divided, would then be cast entirely on the side of peace. Forcible spoliation also takes another form. Without waiting for a man to produce something in order to rob him, they take possession of the man himself, deprive him of his freedom, and force him to work. They do not say to him, If you will do this for me, I will do that for you. But they say to him, You take all the troubles, we all the enjoyments. This is slavery. Now it is important to inquire whether it is not in the nature of uncontrolled power always to abuse itself. For my part, I have no doubt of it, and should as soon expect to see the power that could arrest a stone in falling proceed from the stone itself, as to trust force within any defined limits. I should like to be shown a country where slavery has been abolished by the voluntary action of the masters. Slavery furnishes a second striking example 
of the impotence of philosophical and religious sentiments in a conflict with the energetic activity of self-interest. This may seem sad to some modern schools, which seek the reformation of society in self-denial. Let them begin by reforming the nature of man. In the Antilles, the masters, from father to son, have, since slavery was established, professed the Christian religion. Many times a day they repeat these words, All men are brothers, love thy neighbor as thyself, in this are the law and the prophets fulfilled. Yet they hold slaves, and nothing seems to them more legitimate or natural. Do modern reformers hope that their mortal creed will ever be as universally accepted, as popular, as authoritative, or as often on all lips as the gospel? If that has not passed from the lips to the heart, over or through the great barrier of self-interest, how can they hope that their system will work this miracle? Well, then, is slavery invulnerable? No. Self-interest, which founded it, will one day destroy it, provided the special interests which have created it do not stifle those general interests which tend to overthrow it. Another truth demonstrated by political economy is that free labor is progressive and slave labor stationary. Hence the triumph of the first over the second is inevitable. What has become of the cultivation of indigo by the blacks? Free labor, applied to the production of sugar, is constantly causing a reduction in the price. Slave property is becoming proportionately less valuable to the master. Slavery will soon die out in America unless the price of sugar is artificially raised by legislation. Accordingly we see today the masters, their creditors and representatives, making vigorous efforts to maintain these laws, which are the pillars of the edifice. Unfortunately, they still have the sympathy of people among whom slavery has disappeared, from which circumstance the sovereignty of public opinion may again be observed. If public opinion is sovereign in the domain of force, it is much more so in the domain of fraud. Fraud is its proper sphere. Stratagem is the abuse of intelligence. Imposture on the part of the despoiler implies credulity on the part of the despoiled, and the natural antidote of credulity is truth. It follows that to enlighten the mind is to deprive this species of spoliation of its support. I will briefly pass in review a few of the different kinds of spoliation which are practiced on an exceedingly large scale. The first which presents itself is spoliation through the avenue of superstition. In what does it consist? In the exchange of food, clothing, luxury, distinction, influence, power, substantial services, for fictitious services. If I tell a man, I will render you an immediate service, I am obliged to keep my word, or he would soon know what to depend upon, and my trickery would be unmasked. But if I should tell him, in exchange for your services, I will do you immense service, not in this world, but in another. After this life you may be eternally happy or miserable, and that happiness or misery depends upon me. I am a vicar between God and man, and can open to you the gates of heaven or of hell. If that man believes me, he is at my mercy. This method of imposture has been very extensively practiced since the beginning of the world, and it is well known to what omnipotence the Egyptian priests attained by such means. It is easy to see how impostors proceed. It is enough to ask oneself what he would do in their place. If I, entertaining views of this kind, had arrived in the midst of an ignorant population, and were to succeed by some extraordinary act or marvellous appearance in passing myself off as a supernatural being, I would claim to be a messenger from God, having an absolute control over the future destinies of men. Then I would forbid all examination of my claims. I would go still further, and, as reason would be my most dangerous enemy, I would interdict the use of reason, at least as applied to this dangerous subject. I would taboo, 
as the savages say, this question, and all those connected with it. To agitate them, discuss them, or even think of them, should be an unpardonable crime. Certainly it would be the acme of art thus to put the barrier of the taboo upon all intellectual avenues which might lead to the discovery of my imposture. What better guarantee of its perpetuity than to make even doubt sacrilege? However, I would add accessory guarantees to this fundamental one. For instance, in order that knowledge might never be disseminated among the masses, I would appropriate to myself and my accomplices the monopoly of the sciences. I would hide them under the veil of a dead language, an hieroglyphic writing. And in order that no danger might take me unawares, I would be careful to invent some ceremony, which day by day would give me access to the privacy of all consciences. It would not be amiss for me to supply some of the real wants of my people, especially if by doing so I could add to my influence and authority. For instance, men need education and moral teaching, and I would be the source of both. Thus I would guide as I pleased the minds and hearts of my people. I would join morality to my authority by an indissoluble chain, and I would proclaim that one could not exist without the other, so that if any audacious individual attempted to meddle with a tabooed question, society which cannot exist without morality would feel the very earth tremble under its feet, and would turn its wrath upon the rash innovator. When things have come to this pass, it is plain that these people are more mine than if they were my slaves. The slave curses his chain, but my people will bless theirs, and I shall succeed in stamping, not on their foreheads, but in the very center of their consciences, the seal of slavery. Public opinion alone can overturn such a structure of iniquity, but where can it begin, if each stone is tabooed? It is the work of time and the printing press. God forbid that I should seek to disturb those consoling beliefs which link this life of sorrows to a life of felicity, but that the irresistible longing which attracts us toward religion has been abused, no one, not even the head of Christianity, can deny. There is, it seems to me, one sign by which you can know whether the people are or are not dupes. Examine religion and the priest, and see whether the priest is the instrument of religion, or religion the instrument of the priest. If the priest is the instrument of religion, if his only thought is to disseminate its morality and its benefits on the earth, he will be gentle, tolerant, humble, charitable, and full of zeal. His life will reflect that of his divine model. He will preach liberty and equality among men, and peace and fraternity among nations. He will repel the allurements of temporal power, and will not allay himself with that which, of all things in this world, has the most need of restraint. He will be the man of the people, the man of good advice and tender consolations the man of public opinion, the man of the evangelist. If, on the contrary, religion is the instrument of the priest, he will treat it as one does an instrument which is changed, bent, and twisted, in all ways, so as to get out of it the greatest possible advantage for oneself. He will multiply tabooed questions. His morality will be as flexible as seasons, men, and circumstances. He will seek to impose on humanity by gesticulations and studied attitudes. An hundred times a day he will mumble over words whose sense has evaporated, and which have become empty conventionalities. He will traffic in holy things, but just enough not to shake the faith in their sanctity, and he will take care that the more intelligent the people are, the less open shall the traffic be. He will take part in the intrigues of the world, and he will always side with the powerful, on the simple condition that they side with him. In a word, it will be easy to see in all his actions that he does not desire to advance religion by the clergy, but the clergy by religion. And as so many efforts indicate an object, and as this object, according to the hypothesis, can be only power and wealth, 
the decisive proof that the people are dupes is when the priest is rich and powerful. It is very plain that a true religion can be abused as well as a false one. The higher its authority, the greater the fear that it may be severely tested. But there is much difference in the results. Abuse always stirs up to revolt the sound, enlightened, intelligent portion of a people. This inevitably weakens faith, and the weakening of a true religion is far more lamentable than of a false one. This kind of spoilation, and popular enlightenment, are always in an inverse ratio to one another, for it is in the nature of abuses to go as far as possible. Not that pure and devoted priests cannot be found in the midst of the most ignorant population, but how can the knave be prevented from donning the cassock, and nursing the ambitious hope of wearing the mitre? Despoilers obey the Malthusian law, they multiply with the means of existence, and the means of existence of knaves is the credulity of their dupes. Turn whichever way you please, you always find the need of an enlightened public opinion. There is no other cure-all. Another species of spoliation is commercial fraud, a term which seems to me too limited, because the tradesman who changes his weights and measures is not alone culpable, but also the physician who receives a fee for evil counsel, the lawyer who provokes litigation, etc. In the exchange of two services, one may be of less value than the other, but when the service received is that which has been agreed upon, it is evident that spoliation of that nature will diminish with the increase of public intelligence. The next in order is the abuse in the public service, an immense field of spoliation, so immense that we can give it but partial consideration. If God had made man a solitary animal, every one would labor for himself. Individual wealth would be in proportion to the services each one rendered to himself. But since man is a social animal, one service is exchanged for another. A proposition which you can transpose if it suits you. In society there are certain requirements so general, so universal in their nature, that provision has been made for them in the organizing of the public service. Among these is the necessity of security. Society agrees to compensate in services of a different nature those who render it the service of guarding the public safety. In this there is nothing contrary to the principles of political economy. Do this for me, I will do that for you. The principle of the transaction is the same, although the process is different but the circumstance has great significance. In private transactions each individual remains the judge both of the service which he renders and of that which he receives. He can always decline an exchange, or negotiate elsewhere. There is no necessity of an interchange of services, except by previous voluntary agreement. Such is not the case with the state, especially before the establishment of representative government. Whether or not we require its services, whether they are good or bad, we are obliged to accept such as are offered, and to pay the price. It is the tendency of all men to magnify their own services, and to disparage services rendered them, and private matters would be poorly regulated, if there was not some standard of value. This guarantee we have not, or we hardly have it, in public affairs. But still society, composed of men, however strongly the contrary may be insinuated, obeys the universal tendency. The government wishes to serve us a great deal, much more than we desire, and forces us to acknowledge as a real service that which sometimes is widely different, and this is done for the purpose of demanding contributions from us in return. The state is also subject to the law of Malthus. It is continually living beyond its means. It increases in proportion to its means, and draws its support solely from the substance of the people. Woe to the people who are incapable of limiting the sphere of action of the state. Liberty, private activity, riches, well-being, independence, dignity, depend upon this. 
There is one circumstance which must be noticed. Chief among the services which we ask of the State is security. That it may guarantee this to us, it must control a force capable of overcoming all individual or collective, domestic or foreign forces which might endanger it. Combined with that fatal disposition among men to live at the expense of each other, which we have before noticed, this fact suggests a danger patent to all. You will accordingly observe on what an immense scale spoliation by the abuses and excesses of the government has been practiced. If one should ask what service has been rendered the public, and what return has been made therefore, by such governments as Assyria, Babylon, Egypt, Rome, Persia, Turkey, China, Russia, England, Spain, and France, he would be astonished at the enormous disparity. At last representative government was invented, and, a priori, one might have believed that the disorder would have ceased as if by enchantment. The principle of these governments is this. The people themselves, by their representatives, shall decide as to the nature and extent of the public service, and the remuneration for those services. The tendency to appropriate the property of another, and the desire to defend one's own, are thus brought in contact. One might suppose that the latter would overcome the former. Assuredly, I am convinced that the latter will finally prevail, but we must concede that thus far it has not. Why? For a very simple reason. Governments have had too much sagacity, people too little. Governments are skillful. They act methodically, consecutively, on a well-concerted plan, which is constantly improved by tradition and experience. They study men and their passions. If they perceive, for instance, that they have warlike instincts, they incite and inflame this fatal propensity. They surround the nation with dangers through the conduct of diplomats, and then naturally ask for soldiers, sailors, arsenals, and fortifications. Often they have but the trouble of accepting them. Then they have pensions, places, and promotions to offer. All this calls for money, hence loans and taxes. If the nation is generous, the government proposes to cure all the ills of humanity. It promises to increase commerce, to make agriculture prosperous, to develop manufactures, to encourage letters and arts, to banish misery, etc. All that is necessary is to create offices and to pay public functionaries. In other words, their tactics consist in presenting, as actual services, things which are but hindrances. Then the nation pays, not for being served, but for being subservient. Governments, assuming gigantic proportions, and by absorbing half of all the revenues. The people are astonished that while marvelous labor-saving inventions, destined to infinitely multiply productions, are ever increasing in number, they are obliged to toil on as painfully as ever, and remain as poor as before. This happens because, while the government manifests so much ability, the people show so little. Thus, when they are called upon to choose their agents, those who are to determine the sphere of, and compensation for, governmental action, whom do they choose? The agents of the government. They entrust the executive power with the determination of the limit of its activity and its requirements. They are like the bourgeois gentilhomme, who referred the selection and number of his suits of clothes to his tailor. However, things go from bad to worse, and at last the people open their eyes, not to the remedy, for there is none as yet, but to the evil. Governing is so pleasant a trade that everybody desires to engage in it. Thus the advisers of the people do not cease to say, we see your sufferings, and we weep over them. It would be otherwise if we governed you. This period, which usually lasts for some time, is one of rebellions and insurrections. When the people are conquered, the expenses of the war are added to their burdens. When they conquer, 
there is a change of those who govern, and the abuses remain. This lasts until the people learn to know and defend their true interests. Thus we always come back to this. There is no remedy but in the progress of public intelligence. Certain nations seem remarkably inclined to become the prey of governmental spoilation. They are those where men, not considering their own dignity and energy, would believe themselves lost if they were not governed and administered upon in all things. Without having travelled much, I have seen countries where they think agriculture can make no progress unless the state keeps up experimental farms, that there will presently be no horses if the state has no stables, and that fathers will not have their children educated, or will teach them only immoralities, if the state does not decide what it is proper to learn. In such a country revolutions may rapidly succeed one another, and one set of rulers after another be overturned. But the governed are none the less governed at the caprice and mercy of their rulers, until the people see that it is better to leave the greatest possible number of services in the category of those which the parties interested exchange after a fair discussion of the price. We have seen that society is an exchange of services, and should be but an exchange of good and honest ones. But we have also proven that men have a great interest in exaggerating the relative value of the services they render one another. I cannot indeed see any other limit to these claims than the free acceptance or refusal of those to whom these services are offered. Hence it comes that certain men resort to the law to curtail the natural prerogatives of this liberty. This kind of spoliation is called privilege or monopoly. We will carefully indicate its origin and character. Every one knows that the services which he offers in the general market are the more valued and better paid for, the scarcer they are. Each one, then, will ask for the enactment of a law to keep out of the market all who offer services similar to his. This variety of spoliation being the chief subject of this volume, I will say little of it here and will restrict myself to one remark. When the monopoly is an isolated fact, it never fails to enrich the person to whom the law has granted it. It may then happen that each class of workmen, instead of seeking the overthrow of this monopoly, claim a similar one for themselves. This kind of spoliation, thus reduced to a system, becomes the most ridiculous of mystifications for every one, and the definite result is that each one believes that he gains more from a general market impoverished by all. It is not necessary to add that this singular regime also brings about an universal antagonism between all classes, all professions, and all peoples, that it requires the constant but always uncertain interference of government, that it swarms with the abuses which have been the subject of the preceding paragraph, that it places all industrial pursuits in hopeless insecurity, and that it accustoms men to place upon the law, and not upon themselves, the responsibility for their very existence. It would be difficult to imagine a more active cause of social disturbance. Justification It may be asked, why this ugly word, spoilation? It is not only coarse, but it wounds and irritates, it turns calm and moderate men against you, and embitters the controversy. I earnestly declare that I respect individuals. I believe in the sincerity of almost all the friends of protection, and I do not claim that I have any right to suspect the personal honesty, delicacy of feeling, or philanthropy of any one. I also repeat that protection is the work, the fatal work, of a common error, of which all, or nearly all, are at once victims and accomplices. But I cannot prevent things being what they are. Just imagine some Diogenes putting his head out of his tub and saying, Athenians, you are served by slaves. Have you never thought that you practice on your brothers the most iniquitous spoliation? Or a tribune speaking in the forums, Romans, you have laid the foundation of all your greatness, on the pillage of other nations. 
they would only state undeniable truths but must we conclude from this that athens and rome were inhabited only by dishonest persons that socrates and plato cato and cincinnatus were despicable characters who could harbor such a thought but these great men lived amidst surroundings that relieved their consciences of the sense of this injustice even aristotle could not conceive the idea of a society existing without slavery in modern times slavery has continued to our own day without causing many scruples among the planters armies have served as the instruments of grand conquests that is to say of grand spoliations is this saying that they are not composed of officers and men as sensitive of their honor even more so perhaps than men in ordinary industrial pursuits men who would blush at the very thought of theft and who would face a thousand deaths rather than stoop to a base action it is not individuals who are to blame but the general movement of opinion which deludes and deceives them a movement for which society in general is culpable thus it is with monopoly i accuse the system and not individuals society as a mass and not this or that one of its members if the greatest philosophers have been able to deceive themselves as to the iniquity of slavery how much easier is it for farmers and manufacturers to deceive themselves as to the nature and effects of the protective system end of section 10 recording by katie riley april 2010